manipulate it. <laughs> well, I think Some more so than others. <laughs> well, I think we're uh, ready to move now to the uh, point of our um, uh, specific concern for the day, and, and that has to do with uh, the manner in which the Church of God has developed among the um, uh, black people in the United States as well as around the world. Dr. Massey has been a part of this um, picture and uh, has been a student of the history of, of the people. So um, we're going to simply, uh, uh, instead of interrupting him by um, asking questions, we're, we're going to uh, uh, now simply let him tell us something of this story. So if you'd like to stand up here, Dr. Massey. I begin by expressing my deep appreciation to Dr. Lewis and Dr. Smith for the opportunity of sharing with you at this time and on this subject. I would indicate that I am presently in the process of revising a book published in 1957 in pamphlet form so that the revision will be well over 200 some pages with far more documentation and certainly up to date on the Church of God and the Negro. I am a stickler for the use of the word Negro as a description because the persons who were involved in this history were so described during the period of time involved in the study. The notion of blackness, while I accept it, and while I recognize the phenomenological nature of its use, does not apply fully to the period that will be under discussion in my book. We have moved through quite a time of designations where labels have been changed again and again. There was, in the earlier years, the use of colored to represent those who are of my spectroscopic order. Others were referred to as Afro-Americans. The designation Negro was the one most widely applied and for reasons of that wideness of application, I have tended to stick to it. Now the cultural label of black has gained wide acceptance. I use it, but historically, Negro is the one which should be used most frequently. If you want further documentation on this, I would suggest that you read John Hope Franklin, his book From Slavery to Freedom, and you'll see a bit of what I am saying in fuller measure. But today, the Church of God and the Negro. Richard Wright noted Negro, black, writer, once referred to the Negro as America's metaphor, by which he meant the very mention of the word or the name America always brings to mind the plight of one of its peoples. You will discover that this is the case when you travel abroad. For America is not always associated with its generosity in terms of what is written on the Statue of Liberty. It's associated with a period of time during which its progress, put that in quotes, was associated with the use of slaves. And with that in my background, you can see why it has been important that I wanted to do research on this matter of the church in its relation to the Negro. Four, 
The church has been so <clears throat> large a part of the American culture and civilization, even influenced by its presuppositions, that the church has had very little immediate effect upon changing the mindset of the nation with reference to social relationships. The changes that came were very, very late. And they were mostly for economic reasons rather than for religious. I can document everything I say. So at a time of questioning, I will be happy to respond to specific questions that you will raise along these lines. It is to be expected that the church in America, being the church, would vigorously busy itself to correct the conditions of social imbalance. But that was not the case for many, many decades. Interestingly, the church had its beginnings under one Jesus of Nazareth, a member of a minority race, a race hurting and smarting under the heels of a majority culture called Roman civilization. So that what Jesus taught his followers was largely a technique of survival by which his followers could handle the sad vicissitudes of their history. In time, however, the church became the tool of the mighty against the weak rather than continuing on in the trend that Jesus set for it as a means of helping those who were weak in their struggle against those who were the mighty. For example, Jesus told his followers, if you are compelled to go one mile, then go two. What was he saying? Is this a spiritual principle? Partly, but it was a survival technique also. But a creative edge on the survival technique to show the one who conscripts you, the Roman soldier, who conscripts you into service to carry his knapsack, that there is no anger in you so that you can take someone who wants to dominate your life and by a creative edge of initiative show them there is something more in you of regard for them than there was in them in regarding you. Now that, that is what he describes, Jesus describes as love, where the person who is hurt, demeaned, degraded, takes the initiative from the one who does the degrading and shows them respect. Now if, if you can't see the creative edge there, then you, you haven't lived with that technique long enough to understand how explosive it can be. In, in the late 50s and early 60s, this technique was used in the American South in the hands of black preachers who were at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And because the technique was so creative, new laws were instituted under the leadership of the late Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and those who were allied with him in the cause of freeing up a bound segment of the American people. Now, he borrowed his insight from the gospel, but he was confirmed that the insight was applicable by watching Mohandas K. Gandhi. For Gandhi used much the same technique of nonviolence in bringing India into its freedom from British rule. But here again, another civilization had its effects upon India, subjugating a civilization that was called Christian. Now, you and I watch the process of history and we ask ourselves, how is it that any Christian culture and civilization, any so-called Christian nation, could be colonial in its policies? And you say to yourself, somehow 
the Christian gospel has been prostituted. Somehow the essential nature of the message has been missed. For it was never in the mind of God, never in the mind of Christ, never in the plan for the church, that slavery should exist in the name of Christ. That colonial policies should be operative in the name of Christ. For human beings are being subjugated, degraded, considered of lesser worth than those who are in power. So you see, something has happened in history. History and uh, church affairs went askew. And the church was not moving along the line that was originally planned for it. Now, we see that in America when the churches themselves condoned slavery and preached in such a way that the slaves were told to obey their masters. And the theology behind all of this even included the notion that the slave had no soul. So therefore, they were not in a moral category. And because they were in, not in a moral category, you were not doing anything against someone who really counted. Now they had the same Bible we had. But still their minds were askew because their minds were conditioned by economic concerns and by the tragedies of misapplied understanding of nature, human nature in particular. Church has been a victim of some sad and sorry thought. And I would encourage you to do your best, whatever background you have denominationally, do your best to go back through those teachings and discover what does your church teach about human life. Because it's at that point that the crucial rub occurs in our theology. How I understand you and how you understand me, how I relate to you and how you relate to me is the nub of the issue regarding church life. For the church, by its very nature, spells community. And if the community is restricted, try to find out why the limitations are there, what sanctions go along with them. And what does scripture say about the sanctions or the limitations themselves? I went through this process early in my life. I had to do it because growing up as what I am in a culture which has largely changed since then, I had to come to terms with how to be a Christian and be a black man at the same time with integrity. Now, the miracle in America is that the black man ever espoused Christianity when it was the religion of the master. What was it that made him see something in it? Well, the first thing to be said is the figure of Jesus. For in reading his Bible, he saw that Jesus was in his position, member of a minority group, dominated by a majority culture. In reading his Bible, the black man saw that the first leaders in the church were the disinherited, largely uneducated. So there was a basic identification not only with Jesus as the Lord, but with the disciples and early members of the church as persons in the same educationally limited category. Now, it 
was the same set of Negroes or blacks who saw in the message of the Church of God movement as it was being heralded after 1880, 81, 82 in the South, they saw the theme of unity and believed that this message of unity held the element of hope for changing a situation which had worked against them. They also saw that some of the early leaders of the movement believed in unity because they showed it by coming among them and showing no difference by speaking to them and by associating with them without any restrictions. So here was an element of hope stirred in their hearts by the exampleship of the early leaders. So they began to envision the implications of this unity and thus a growing number of blacks became very, very enamored of the Church of God teachings, primarily at the point of unity, and secondly, at the point of holiness of life. Those are the two major doctrines of the Church of God which have held a strong appeal to American Negroes throughout the decades of our contact with the movement's message. Holiness and unity. <coughs> I divide the history of the Church of God contacts with American Negroes into three periods. I'll put it over here so that my standing here will not obscure what I've written. There is, first of all, the provincial period. And I have arbitrarily listed um, 1886 through 1915. The second is the developmental period. Nineteen sixteen through nineteen forty six, and the progressive period nineteen forty seven through now. Dr. Smith and Dr. Lewis have acquainted you with the beginning of the movement and how under Daniel Sidney Warner a chief concern was to get the churches to see that denominationalism has no future. Many of the leaders who worked along with him and who followed him after his death in 1895 or 1897? Okay. December, wasn't it? Yeah. Those who followed him after his death took the emphasis of unity and tried their best to make some application of it and the applications varied from person to person and from time to time. One of the applications of unity meant to some of the leaders that all denominational systems need to be scrapped. Some others tried to work within the denominations by just spreading the message of unity so that there would be fellowship between believers, despite the denominational categories. So between those two those two poles of, of application, the rest of us tend to fit. And even today, there are some who say, denominationalism has to go. And along with it, all conciliarism and everything that smacks of human organization. You'll find that in the Church of God, that view. 
But you also find those who recognize that the message is the major thing and not the full application of it in terms of destroying any systems of order by which groups have tended to do their work. Now, it's very important that you see that group order, ways of facilitating our work through organized patterns of operation, it's important that you see that that is not inimitable to unity. Much as a family has its own system of operating under its own roof, and yet it is part of a larger community on a certain set of streets, even so, systems of order can be just as legitimate so long as the wider community is understood and the smaller groups relate effectively with it. So there is a place for saying that denominational systems are dangerous and can be divisive, but there's also a place for saying structured ways of operating are also necessary. Now, having said that about organizations, I must say it also about uh, social groupings due to race. Blacks do have some cultural distinctives, just as any social group will have certain cultural distinctives. And it is in their freedom to band together for the preservation of those distinctives, for the nurturing of them, for passing them on to their children. There's nothing evil about that, whether the group is white, black, red, or yellow. But if those cultural distinctives are the center of their life, then they have missed what Jesus Christ came to do. Culture must never be the center of the group. Christ must be the center of the group. And this must always be kept clear. Doctrine must not be the center of the group, but Christ himself. For doctrines are always different, depending upon our perspective, our understanding. If you ever argue over doctrine, you are as silly as the person who raises the argument or stands there after you raise it. Doctrines are not to be argued. These are reasonings of the mind based upon data that have come to us. And always our understandings are limited. We're always seeking to see more into what we have. So to argue over doctrine is silly. But to love each other and live one's way into a doctrine is wiser. Well, I, I'd like to explicate more on that, but I, I won't. The blacks have tended to cluster, but mainly because of a pattern of rejection during this early period. The black churches in America, I'm speaking now of the black denominations, AME Church, African Methodist, African Methodist Episcopal, AMEZ, African Methodist Episcopal Zion, Baptist churches, National Baptist, Progressive Baptist, and others. All of them that are black by orientation, by membership, had their rise just before this provincial period, and some of them during this provincial period, an early part of it, because of rejection on the part of the dominant white culture in America. I trace much of this in one of the chapters in my new book on Christian unity. So if you want to track down many of the references and try to get some, some line on a wider view about it, read one of the chapters there. In the Church of God, at the beginning, there was free flow between the races for sake of fellowship. The free flow stopped when the implication of unity was applied in the area of freedom to intermarry. 
As long as unity involved us religiously, without affecting our human culture, there were no problems. But when the question of marriage culture came up, does unity mean that we are free to interrelate culturally on the level of marriage, then the provincial notions <coughs> influenced our pattern of growth and division occurred between the races. You can see this being traced in pages of the Gospel Trumpet beginning in 1897 in an editorial by E.E. E. Byram. You see it as late as 1912. I've traced the literature, thousands and thousands of pages, pulled out the data. So has Dr. Smith. So across this period, there was a long searching and researching of how the doctrine of unity is to be applied. Are there proscriptions for it? Are there limitations? Does it apply only spiritually? We are born again and we belong to the church in our hearts, but culturally we are not affected by unity as to marriage, human love. Well, this was the period when all of that was being searched and researched. Some whites came out on the side of saying, in communities where it does not cause flagrant disturbances. Worshiping together is to be the norm. But there were some others who said, worshiping together is going to lead to social togetherness, which will lead to intermarriage. So, in order to avoid coming to that frontier, let us build a wall to keep us further back from it. So the congregations were divided. If you don't know what provincial means, I say look it up. Uh, because it, it categorizes the thought, the social thought that was responsible for the development of the separateness during that period. I would like to say that um, some of the older leaders who knew the pattern of inclusiveness at an earlier point, when they saw the division occurring as late as 1912 and 13, and some of the influence of that uh, divided thought affected the camp meetings here at Anderson, some of them left Anderson and never returned after that because they felt the doctrine of unity was being <coughs> denied. The implications of it were of no importance to them anymore. So they said, since we had allied ourselves with this movement because of its doctrine of unity and holiness, we see that both are going by the board. Unity no longer means what it once meant, and holiness has also been hindered because we see that the Holy Spirit is no longer in control of the church. This was a very crucial period, very crucial period. So, a development along racial lines began to show itself in a very formal way beginning around 1916. Now I've arbitrarily divided uh, between 1915 and 1916 because of, of the data that are available for this sort of study. We began to see that, that states are developing ministerial assemblies, not in any, not in any um, legal way yet, until 1920 or 1922 in Michigan, when, which was the first incorporated legal, legal group in any state. But here they are developing ministerial associations, one black, one white, 
in the different states for convenience to sit together and plan for the development of the congregations and the growth of the work but in, in two separate ways. I have put 1946 there as the tentative cutoff point for this kind of thing because in 1947, there was a bit more progressive thought on how the church should be applying his doctrine of unity at the level of race. In 1947, there was an interracial commission set up by the General Assembly. They called it General Ministerial Assembly then. And the interracial commission had as its province of operation to think through the church's problem at the level of race and make some recommendations to the General Ministerial Assembly on how our churches can show unity at that level. Now you see, we are almost back where we were before. There was a, an awareness now that unity has to be applied racially as well as in any other way. It has not to do with the destruction of denominational systems if it cannot also have some destructive power against racial notions. But uh, that was causing some a great deal of alarm. In time, there was a study commission set up. And the study commission came back and made some of its recommendations. And finally, in the late 60s, there was an open door policy that had been framed and was read to the general ministerial assembly about all Church of God congregations will be open to any and everyone who wants to come and attend and belong. Many churches and their leaders signed that and posted it on their bulletin <coughs> boards so that anyone who would come through its doors would know this is an open church. But before that kind of open door policy statement ever came to the floor of the General Assembly, the Civil Rights Movement had done its major work so that the conditioning society was now more open. So the church is still following society rather than being the vanguard. Eleven minutes left before noon. I, why don't I stop and let them raise questions? All right, if you'd like to. Uh, in the 60s, right. yes. Does that mean every church of God or every member of the General Assembly um, adopted that? No. no. It means that those who are attending the assembly that year heard it read and had an opportunity to react to it there on the spot. But also there was opportunity to react to it when they got back home because the open door policy statement was sent out by the executive council in its mailings so that each pastor and set of church offices and congregational members could sit down in their own local church setting, discuss it, and decide what they would do on the basis of this that was recommended. Some did, some didn't. So if a congregation, for example, voted to close its doors just recently, would they be going against um, church God policy? We cannot call it Church of God policy because <laughs> by our very polity of operation, we hardly have any. Our system is so free, and yet at some other points it's so bound, that we are a kind of anomaly. I, I don't really understand us at certain points. <laughs> as long as I've been with us, I don't understand it. At some points we are hard and fast, on other points we're loose and free. I, at the points where our doctrine is mainly concerned, we have a way we want it stated, but we have no full way in which we want to see it applied, and this bothers me. I hope I'm not overstating the case, but it does bother me. By overstating it, you catch the point much sooner. Other questions? Uh, you mentioned or touched on some of the techniques used by uh, Martin Luther King and Gandhi, mm -hmm. uh, the techniques of going a second mile on that. Um, these techniques were used a lot against supposedly Christian nations, you know, like Britain or mm -hmm. here. Do you think those techniques are uh, <coughs> equally usable in a place like 
uh, Cambodia against a Pol Pot or against a Hitler or against someone who has no moral. Yes, they are usable there. But the risk is greater where the moral conscience does not have the same kind of training behind it. For example, non-cooperation in a non-violent way would work one way in India. For example, at the Salt March and when Gandhi and his hordes of Indians refused to cooperate with the British government in things that it was trying to, the British government was trying to do. They sat down on the British government, refused to do anything. Now, the British were too humane to just come along and kill them because they sat down. They just decided to wait it out and then to work through some changes to appease the Indians. But now in Cambodia or somewhere else where the regime is bloodthirsty, those who do not cooperate, even if they do it non-violently, can get killed. So the risk is greater where the moral conscience is not uh, backed by the same set of conditions. Well then eventually will the same effect come or will eventually this yes. people die out? Yes, the seed of the martyrs is the the blood of the martyrs is a seed of the church. There's something creative about human suffering in the interest of justice, and it is never lost. I, I remember in 1966, at a meeting in Berlin, watching on the platform two men who were members of the Orca tribe in Ecuador, South America, recent converts, from the labors of missionaries who had been killed 10 years earlier. And one of these two men on the, on the platform in Berlin was one of the murderers who had blown a poison dart into the back of one of the five missionaries who were killed. When those five missionaries were killed in 1956, the world said, what a waste. But 10 years later, the work was deeper among that tribe than it had been in 1956. And the murder of those missionaries had had a great deal to do with the change of the climate toward the gospel there. You see, there is never any loss when one is a Christian and suffers on moral grounds. There is never any loss. In time, there is a payoff from it. This is what conditions the Christian to accept any amount of suffering and to do it willingly, knowing that you cannot lose, ultimately. Jim Elliott, one of the men who was killed, one of the five missionaries killed down there in South America said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. There's a guarantee that works with the gospel. But the church doesn't believe that. So there's no loss if you're a Christian? What if you're a Hindu or a Muslim? Or what about the loss there? Well, now my theology would have to come to my defense. All suffering is redemptive, but on different levels. Christian suffering is redemptive because it fills up that which is lacking of the sufferings of Christ throughout the rest of history. I don't want to take time to explain that. Any human suffering is redemptive if it has at its core a moral issue for which the person risks his or her life in the interest of another human being or some worthy cause. It cannot be lost. All suffering is redemptive. Dr. Massey, uh, in the early part of this uh, third period, which you've identified here, there was uh, a great deal of talk about integration. Mm. We don't hear much about that anymore. Does, does that mean we've uh, lost ground? I don't think so. I think it's a kind of stopgap, Dr. Smith, where each group is seeking to identify its strengths in order that the bargaining process for a closer union with each other can be viable. So that each one goes into the quest for a more visible unity with some negotiable power. In other words, you need me for this reason, you know. This is not personal to you. <laughs> but, but I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that each group says, these are my strengths. And I want to share them with you. 
The other one says, these are my strengths. I want to share them with you. So each one goes in with a sense of identity so that out of a, an understood identity, there can really be integration for cause. So that no one group is swallowed up by another, but all the groups are associating with some sense of what it means to all the others. Yeah. Integration on any other terms than those is faulty. Is, um, I seem to get into you said the issue here that's keeping unity from being reality is socioeconomic. I mean, how do you explain a situation like here at Anderson? I mean, I see like the church I attend, South Meridian. I don't think there's a black family that goes there. I mean, and most of the people, you know, we have Sherman Street, which is mostly black, I think. You know, I haven't, I haven't attended there at all. I mean, how do we explain the situation here? I mean, it seems that most of the people here are in the same socioeconomic division. I mean, why isn't there more integration than churches here? Is it socio socioeconomic issue. If it's not racial, why isn't there more racial integration here? Might be cultural. Simply cultural. But my thesis is there can be visible unity if the two agree that they will mingle their cultures for the strengths that they can graft each other. And I insist that this is the vanguard of the future, the mingling of strengths. Our world is one, for better or for worse. And the church had better be. Would you consider that a significant goal for achievement during the 80s in terms of uh, the Church of God. We use the integration of the Church of God. Would that be a significant goal for achievement in the 80s? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. But those who think through the process for reaching that goal must give due regard to cultural differences and how they will help to strengthen the togetherness of the groups rather than provide polarities within the group. It's a carefully thought out process. Well, we do have black churches, what, what we call black churches, where the majority of the constituency is, is, is black. Um, the point has been made in recent years that these are the churches that are growing. How do you account for that? They are growing because they are rooted solidly in a black community in a given town or city so that their area of reach is cultural. The dynamism of what happens in the black setting also explains that growth. I wish I had time to talk about the celebrative nature of black worship the communal spirit of black people, you'll find that they like to congregate, they like to be together. In their worship services, the note of celebration is high, there is praise. It is not stark, it is not staid, there's movement, even physical sometimes. <laughs> so that there is a release of tension through Emotional activities, singing, clapping. Now, more so in some places than in other places, depending upon how one's culture has been modified. Because you'll find as much variation in black churches as you will find in the whole spectrum of American Christianity itself. There is no such thing as one black style. No such thing. Just as there is no such thing as one white style. Because you're dealing with human nature and all the variations that apply to individuals also apply to groups. So to speak about the black experience is as wide as speaking about the American experience. It's a very wide thing. Never stereotype. But for sake of popular usage, we say black churches, black preaching, black worship, black style, black singing, meaning that it is free, it has movement, 
It is contagious, but it can differ widely, like the sun does from the moon. Is there a, a significant black leader, say, in the provincial period who would be perhaps to the black church what Warner was to the white church, who has perhaps not had the uh, proper acclaim historically? No, there were about five during the provincial period who, because of their close association with each other, must be ranked together. But no one at that time <coughs> stands taller than any of the others. They were all together. Um, for example, there was R.J. Smith, there was, near the close of this period, J.D. Smoot, there was Charles H. Hill, there was Daniel F. Oden, and there's another one that should be mentioned, um, Jane Williams, a woman. Those five were the, were the five leading persons during this period, some closer to the end of it, and their ministry extended on into here. But those were the, those were the major five. During the development period, was there any significant black leader who made a general contribution to the general Church of God during the 19, from 1960 yes. to 1946, who perhaps has not had any. He, well, the one who did have the most clout throughout the Church of God during this period was Raymond Jackson. But he has been given his due in, in writing as well as in honor. And then what would his major contribution have been? Can you... His major contribution was leading the Ministerial Assembly of uh, National Association. That's his major contribution. Because there were other pastors who were as notable as he as a pastor. But uh, because he was the head of all the black ministers who belonged to the National Association, he received more esteem and acclaim. Some of these uh, fellows live in Dunn Hall. Uh, you say about yes, Dunn came later. Dunn's major focus was during the developmental period. He was converted during this period, so that he's a late leader rather than an early one. In fact, he came to Chicago, where he became pastor there, right about in the 30s. Was it the 30s? Was a very uh, influential in terms of finances. Do you have any information? Late, was it late 20s that Don came to Chicago as pastor? It may I, I, can, I can check that out, no. but, but it wasn't early. It wasn't in the early period. Don pastored first in Louisiana for a while and then finally came to Chicago. He was very wealthy, or, or some would say he was wealthy. Do you, what do you attribute to that? He was a businessman. He was a businessman who knew how to utilize the resources of his community. So he helped his church to grow, partly because of what he helped the members to do and be in the community. There's always a tie between the black pastor and the community, so that we make no distinction between social gospel and salvation of the soul. They all go together. It doesn't mean that because you're socially active, you're saved, but it does mean that the gospel has to apply to the whole range of life. We're not just interested in getting you saved and then you were out of work. No, if you're saved, we've got to get you a job and help you, help you stay on the job and help you gain some authority and experience and help you gain your freedom and everything else. It's a whole package to the black church, not just a matter of getting you saved in touch with Jesus. It might begin there, but it doesn't stop there with us. Well, our time has passed, but let's Sorry. ask you one more question. Go Gita. ahead. Which we try to ask everybody. Uh, as a black person, how do you feel about the future of the Church of God? Ah. As a black person, my thought about the Church of God and its future does not apply to race at all. Now, I'm not saying that as a purist. I'm saying this because the big issue among us at the present time is not race. The prior question has to be, 
how is our message of unity to be applied to the wide spectrum of the church? If we can solve that, I think we can solve the lesser issue of relating of the races. We have not yet determined how our major doctrine of unity fits in with the World Council of Churches, with the National Council of Churches, and these are prior questions. For our relationships with the rest of the church world is a far more consequence for our message to be heard and understood than the little tensions we feel because of our cultural differences in our group. And until we solve the problem closer to the top, <coughs> I'm, mo I'm more concerned to work on that level than on the lesser issue of racial contacts. Well, Dr. Massey, thank you so much. We all want to say Because I was doing my research in Chicago. Mm -hmm.